All right. This morning we're going to talk about um, Bethlehem and the Messiah. Um, I'm kind of going through the uh, Christmas story and emphasizing on the uh, Old Testament quotations. We looked at last time the subject of the Messiah that he is Emmanuel, which is that he is God with us. And we looked at Isaiah chapter 7, and we saw that in the midst of trials and tribulation and hardship, that God was going to be in the midst of the people. But Ahaz uh, wanted nothing to do with God. He wanted nothing to do with Yahweh. He wanted to do things his own way. But despite of that, God was still going to give him a sign. And that sign was going to be the Messiah, Jesus. We move now to the quotation of Bethlehem. And um, we see that in chapter um, 2, when the wise men come from the east and they come to Jerusalem and they ask the king of where the child was to be born that was called the king of the Jews. And uh, Herod didn't know, but all the priests and the Levites, they did know. And they said, well, that's easy. It's in Bethlehem. And they quote um, in Matthew chapter 2 and uh, verse 5, it says, In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Um, For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And um, that is the quotation. Well, what is the context behind that quotation? Well, the context is, is found in the prophet of Micah. Now, Micah is one of those interesting uh, books that if you blink, you'll miss it. Um, the, the major quotation that people get from Micah is found not in the fifth chapter where we'll be this morning, but in the sixth chapter that deals with He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to act justly and to do mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The people of the day of Micah were thinking to themselves, as long as I go through the motions, as long as I show up to church and I act somewhat religious, that God will accept me. And um, He says, I don't want you to just play church. I want you to do church. I want you to be the people of God. And they wanted nothing to do with that. And so this is kind of a judgment in chapters 4 and 5 of what happens when people don't obey. And we're going to emphasize this morning on chapter 5. And we're going to see a tale of twos. We're going to see two cities and two births and two victories. All of twos. And what he is saying here, he says that uh, we're looking at the future or we're looking at the present, but then we look to that there will be hope in the future. So let's look here. And I, at Micah chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 1, and we see uh, the first point, which is two cities. Now, I'm not talking about Charles Dickens' book, A Tale of Two Cities, although that's a wonderful book. That's not the book that I'm talking about here. He is contrasting two cities. 
one city that is great and another city that is small. And he is saying that uh, that one that glory will depart from one and go to another. The first city that we find is in verse 1, and that is the city of Jerusalem. Now you'll say to me, but pastor, the word Jerusalem is not found here. And I would agree with you to say that the word Jerusalem is not found in this passage. But it is definitely referring to Jerusalem. Will you listen to me? Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. Now, where do I get Jerusalem from? I, I get Jerusalem from the fact that it was the dwelling place of the ruler. Now, we all know that the ruler lived in Jerusalem. It is the place that David established his throne. And so, um, he comes here and he says that they're going to um, lay siege against us. And this is referring here to the Babylonian exile. Now, I don't have time to give you a full Jewish history. If I would do that, I would require uh, many, many hours of your time in which we do not have, and you'll probably boo me off the stage before I am done. But basically the story goes is that there, there was a whole bunch of good kings and there were some bad kings and and at the end there were more bad kings than good kings. And they began to incorporate the worship of the pagan nations around them. They worshipped the Asherah poles, which were these totem pole thingies, they began to worship the starry hosts, which they were the sun and the moon and the stars. They worshipped Baal. They worshipped a whole bunch of different gods. And you would say, well, that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, it, it, why would God get rid of a nation for doing that? Well, uh, along with worshipping those people came a lot of de um, practices that were wicked that were evil uh, such as sacrificing your son or your daughter in the fire i don't know about you but i don't know if i want to do that child sacrifice that's what that's called that's not uh that's not good human sacrifice um they practiced witchcraft and uh consulted mediums and spiritists it was not a good thing and so God says, I've given you plenty of time to repent, and you've chosen not to do that, so I'm going to have to take you and put you into exile. And what's exile? Exile is God's time out. <laughs> he says, you want, to be, you want to be naughty? I'm going to put you in time out for 70 years. And he does that. And he says in verse 1, Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against you. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. And this, at, at the time of the Babylonian exile, is the last time that the nation Israel will have a king until a new king. Okay, But this is the first, the first city. The first city um, is that of, of Jerusalem. The, the second city, then, is the city of Bethlehem. And he compares them. Uh, he calls the first one, he, he, it's a great city. Uh, it is a big city. And um, for that, you, you want to go to uh, verses 9 and 10 uh, for that, of chapter 4. Um, where he says, why do you cry aloud and have no king? Has your counselor perished that pain seizes you like a woman in labor? Ride in agony, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon and there you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hands of the enemies. Okay, 
Now, the word city that is translated in verse 4, it, the word means great city. Okay, And so this Bethlehem, he compares it to not being a great city, but he says it's a small city. And he says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephetaph, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old and from ancient times. Now, he is saying here that there is going to be something great that comes from this little town of Bethlehem. Now up to this point, there's only two famous people that we know that come from Bethlehem. Anyone want to take a shot at who, who came from Bethlehem? David? David, of course, yes. David came from Bethlehem. His father Jesse was a Bethlehemite. And you can read about all that fun stuff in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, where it talks about that Saul or Samuel sent um, Saul, uh, Samuel was sent by the Lord to um, Bethlehem to anoint a new king, and David was there. And also we recall that Ruth was from Bethlehem. Now, she wasn't originally from Bethlehem, but she moved with Naomi uh, to the city of Bethlehem. And we can read that in, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, and then um, down into um, verse um, um, 22. Um, so those were the two famous people uh, who were from Bethlehem. But he says that there's going to be one more. And that is going to be the Messiah. That the Messiah was going to come from the land of Bethlehem. Or from the city of Bethlehem. It says, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now that last phrase means that uh, origins means that people have come there that would be known. You would know who comes from Bethlehem. And of course, we know that by reading in the New Testament that this is a reference to Jesus, right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We, we read about that in the Gospel of Luke, right? That there was no more room in the inn. And so they had to have... Baby Jesus in, in, in a, a, a stable or in a cave, a place where they would keep the sheep and the, and the cows and the animals in the barn, if you will. And so we have that there. And so that's Bethlehem. Not much. I mean, if you go to Bethlehem, it's one of those things you blink and you miss the, the city. It's not a very big city. It's not a very, uh, you know, you would think that a ruler would come from a great city. Right? It would be like saying that the, the ruler of uh, the Messiah would come from Globe. Really? Globe? You know? When you think of a ruler would come from New York or Los Angeles or Miami or or a big, big city, not from globe. And he says, but you who are small will yet be big. Notice that he compares the two. That the king who is in Jerusalem will leave and the, the city that is small will gain a new leader. And he is now referring to the Messiah. And so the rest of this chapter then begins to shift from the present, right, to the future. Because he says that although that we're going to get rid of the king at the present time, although there, but I'm not going to forget about David and his throne, 
because Bethlehem is the city of David, he says that I will, what does he say? One who will be ruler over Israel. So the future hope. That's a tale of two cities. Then we have in verses uh, 4 and 5, or 3 and 4, we have a tale of two births. Birth number 1 speaks of the birth and the rejection of Christ. Now, although it doesn't talk about his birth per se, it does speak of the rejection of Christ. Verse 3, Therefore Israel will be abandoned, Until the time she who is in labor gives birth. And the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. At the time of the exile, the nation of Israel felt abandoned. But they weren't abandoned, although they felt it because God's presence had left Um, Jerusalem. When the Messiah came, John said in John 1 verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But what happened was is the people rejected Him as their Messiah. They They didn't want Him to be their Messiah. They were looking... For someone else. Okay. They rejected him. Jesus makes mention of this. In Luke chapter 13. Verses 34 and 35. So turn over if you will. To the book of Luke for a moment. Luke chapter 13. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. What they meant is he would love to take them as his own and to to establish himself as their Messiah. But he says, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now he is referring there to when he comes back as the conquering king in the book of Revelation. The first century people rejected Christ as the Messiah. And so they felt abandoned because he had to abandon them. They didn't want him, so he had to leave. Therefore, Israel was abandoned. Abandoned in the first exile. And when Jesus died on the cross, he had to abandon them again. But thank heavens that he is not abandoned totally. That he is with us, right? We talked about that last time. But this whole thing is referring to the abandonment of Israel is is meaning of, of setting up an earthly kingdom. Because they were not ready the first time, uh, he, he was going to wait until the, his second coming. Okay? Then we have the second birth, which is a reference to his second coming when he returns again as recorded in Revelation. And that's where he says in verse 4, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God and and they will live in security for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth now that is re- that is referring to the millennial kingdom friends we're not there yet <laughs> okay that's something that is yet to come 
when Christ will come and establish his kingship, and he will reign forever and ever. Right now, he is like David. Saul is the king. He's not the rightful king, but he's the king. And until the right time comes for Jesus to be the rightful king of the world, all he can do is take people to be their personal kings. Now what that means is that we, we where is our loyalty? Is our loyalty with Jesus or is our loyalty with Satan? And when Christ comes and he sets up his kingdom, then he will be established. But until then, where is our loyalty? Is our loyalty to Jesus or is our loyalty to Satan? The Bible says that he is the prince of the power of the air and he is the ruler of the kingdom of this earth. Yes, he is the king of this earth, Satan at this time, but he is not the rightful king. He didn't take it because he was given it. He took it because he stole it. And Christ will come and he will redeem all things and set up his kingdom. And he is the king, but he's not the king on the throne at this time on this earth. And that, when, when I'm referring to that is I'm referring to there. It's a, all a very complicated network of things that I don't even know if I understand fully. And I have a degree. Sometimes I think it makes it even more complicated. But that's birth number two. That Christ will be established in the nation Israel. Right? He will stand and shepherd his flock. And the shepherd is a picture of the king. He will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And, he will, and they will live in security for men, uh, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. That's referring to the millennial kingdom. Then we have two victories. Christ will, victory number one, Christ was referring to the uh, millennial kingdom. That Christ will come and he will eliminate all of the enemies of the world that are against Israel. That's why people say today, be very careful of going against Israel. You do not want to make an enemy of Israel. And some people will say, well, that's not the Israel. The Israel of today is not the Israel of the Bible. I don't want to take no chances. <laughs> I don't want to be on the losing end of that stick at all. Okay. All I know is that when Christ comes... And if you're not on Israel's side or the nation Israel's side, you are in trouble. So what does that, that leave for Christians? Well, the good news is that because of Christ's death, we have been grafted into the nation Israel. We are part of the nation Israel. Not of Abraham's descent. We are still Gentiles. But we have been grafted in. We have our own place. We are one within the nation Israel, but we are we have our own our own place and our own role. Okay? So we are with them. <laughs> but we don't want to be against them. Because this is what he says will happen to his enemies. Look at verse five. He ends well, he will be their peace, their shalom. Right? And that is a reference of that he will take all the broken pieces. Of, of their lives and he will rebuild it and put it back together. When the Assyrian invades our land and marches through the fortresses, we will rise against him seven shepherds, even eight leaders of men. They will rule the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod will dr with the drawn sword, and he will deliver us from the Assyrian when he invades our land and marches onto our borders. The remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers of, on the grass which do not wait for man, or linger of for mankind. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, in the midst of many peoples, 
like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, which mauls and mangles as it grows, as it goes, and no one can rescue. Your hand will be lifted up in triumph over your enemies, and all your foes will be destroyed. As much as I can say about this is I'll say this, of, of this section. I don't know much about it. All that I know is that at the end, God wins. That's what I put next to this section. At the end, God wins. Whose side are you on? Are you on God's side or are you on their side? And I don't know about you, but I want to be on God's side. But not only is he going to have a victory over their enemies, but he's also going to have a victory over the nation Israel and over their personal sin. And what he's going to do here is he's going to remove things in their life that causes them to sin. Now, I want you to notice this because there's a lot of things in our lives that God uses or that, 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 that cause us to sin that God can sometimes get rid of in our lives to help us so that we don't sin. He, look at verse 10. In that day declares the Lord, I will destroy your horses from among you and demolish your chariots. Now this is referring to the nation of Israel thinking that it's their own might and their own military victory that's going to gain them the victory. He says, I'm going to take that away. He says, you're going to see that it has to be God that gains the victory. Not your horses, not your chariots, but God. He says, I'll take that away. You want to trust in horses and chariots? I'll take that out of your life. The next one is cities and strongholds. We think, oh, look at this great city. Look at this great place of fortress. I can place my trust that that our cities and our strongholds, that's where our hope lies. He says, I'll get rid of that too. Verse 11. I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down all your strongholds. Verse 12 speaks of, of witchcraft and spells, people that try to conjure up things. And control evil or control spirits. You can't control no spirit, I'll tell you that. <laughs> the whole idea of witchcraft and wizardry, wizardry is that you can control spirits. Well, let me have another thing coming. They don't, you don't control nothing, they hold you as a puppet. They may do what you say every once in a while. But they just do that to bait you and to get you hooked. But what you find is that you're really a slave to them. Okay, there's no... And he says, I'll take that away too. He says, I will destroy your carved images and your sacred stones from among you. I'll take all your idols in your life. I'll take all the things that that are biting for my time. He said, I'll get rid of all those. And you will no longer bow down to the work of their hands. I will uproot from you among you the Asherah poles and demolish your cities. And I will take vengeance and anger and wrath upon the nations that have not obeyed me. He says, here's this. Here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to get rid of anything that will hinder you from worshiping me totally and completely. There are three wonderful things that we can take away from this passage. Number one is this. Don't feel insignificant because God can use the insignificant like Bethlehem. You know, so many times we feel in our lives that we feel helpless. God can't use me. I'm small. God can't use this church. We're too little. God can't use us. But what does he tell the people of Bethlehem? He says, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me 
one who will be ruler over Israel. What does that mean? That means that God can do the significant with the insignificant. God can do the big with the small. Or He can do the big through the small. In fact, that's the way He likes to do it. So if you think that we're too small for God to do any work through us, you got another thing coming. Because God loves to do big things through small people. Why? Because then we can't say we did it. We can't say we did it because of our great evangelism budget. We can't say that we did it because of all the workers we had. We have to stop and say, I'm a job thing. But it's easy. It's easy to feel insignificant. It's easy to go, well, why do I even bother? That's the message of the Bethlehem. This is an encouragement. Hey, I know you're small. Hey, I know you're weak. But you're going to have a ruler. Be Take courage. Number two. Don't feel abandoned. Because God will make it all right in the end. Sometimes we feel abandoned because of things we've done because our own choices. We've caused the Messiah to abandon us for a, a time because of our own sin. Other times we feel abandoned because that's the way Satan does. He puts false guilt and false abandonment in us. And he makes us feel that we're all alone and we're not really all alone. Whatever it might be, whether it's from our own doing or from not our own doing, we can rest assured that we're not really abandoned. What he's saying here is really it should say not, it shouldn't say in verse 3, um, therefore I will be, Israel will be abandoned. It should say, therefore Israel feels abandoned. Because it's not really that God is abandoning anybody because He doesn't do that. Rather, it's that they feel abandoned. But here's the thing. God never left them. God never turned their back on Him. We know that because He's sending them a ruler. All goes back to Bethlehem. But I will send you a ruler. <laughs> Don't feel abandoned. Don't feel that God has left you because He hasn't left you. Sometimes you feel abandoned because you're in God's time out. <laughs> God wants you to cool down for a moment. God wants you to, to get your bearings on, to repent and, and turn back to Him. When you're feeling abandoned, it's a great time to look in yourself and ask yourself, Lord, is this, is this my own doing or is this from another origin? If it's my own doing, Lord, help me to, to, to prepare and, and get things set up so that I can, which leads me to number three. That God wants to give you victory from your sins. What is he cutting off? Or what is it that you need to have cut off? Remember where he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to destroy this and I will tear down that and I'm going to get rid of this. Is there something in your life that God says, you know what, that needs to come down. Maybe it's a love of a job. Maybe it's a uh, maybe it's money. Maybe it's it's 
family or friends or whatever it might be that is <coughs> excuse me that is hindering your life that it's taking the place of God you know when what oftentimes we think of idol worship we think of bowing down to some kind of stone statue or golden statue we're really idol worship and and God spends the first five commandments in the Old Testament saying that we're to worship no other God other than God. Right? Commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number two. You shall not make for yourself a golden image. An image in heaven above or in the earth beneath. You shall not bow yourself to worship them. So not only are we to worship no other God but God, but we're not to make things and put them in front of God. Number three tells us, the third commandment says, that you shall not remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That we are to set aside a time and a place in our lives where we worship God. And then the fourth commandment is that we are to not take the name of the Lord our God in vain. And basically that is referring to that we don't take the value out of His name. Does God's name have value in your life? Is it valuable? Is God's name more valuable to you than gold or silver or precious jewels? That's what that's what the you shall not take. We oftentimes think of using swear words, and that's also, but but it it, it has a more richer context of that you should not devalue the name to where you use it like you would any other name. That it has a value, that it's precious, it's sacred to you. The Jews took that so much that they wouldn't even use the name of Yahweh because they were afraid that they were going to misuse it. So what is God taking away in your life? What does he need to take away? Maybe it might be a sense of pride in your life. The horses, the chariots. Whom do you put your your confidence and your hope in? You know, a lot of times people will place our confidence and our hope in our nation over God. And and my friends, God will take that. (laughs) He'll pull that rug out from beneath us. He will not compete. He will not compete. He'll take our horses. He'll take our chariots. He'll take our. He'll take anything that we have in our lives that is competing for His place in our lives. So when we think of a little town of Bethlehem, just remember, God can use you and God can use me because He can use the insignificant. He can use the minimal to do the mighty for His kingdom. But in order for Him to be able to do that, He's got to get rid of all of the crap and all of the crud that is in our hearts that is hindering us from being the people That God has called us to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. That you can use the small and insignificant. That you are willing to use the little town of Bethlehem. To house your son, Jesus just like you can use us to further your kingdom. 
But Father, we realize that sin and idols and things in our lives can clutter up our insignificant beings to make it difficult for you to use us. And so, Father, you have to come into our lives and and get rid of all that crud and cleanse all of that grime. Father, help us, show us the things in our lives that are hindering to you that we may be vessels like Bethlehem. Small, but yet willing and ready to receive the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We pray for your help in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.